Her PhD was from Western University, yay. Uh, her research interests include forest ecology, ecological modeling, and sustainability science. Uh, she's currently full professor and university research chair in the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of Guelph. Her debut collection, this is your first collection of poems, I hate you. Uh, her first debut collection of poems, A New Index for Predicting Catastrophes, was published by McClellan and Stewart Penguin Random House Canada in 2015. It's received praise nationally and internationally and was nominated for a 2016 Trillium Book Award for Poetry. Congratulations. Uh, Publishers Weekly wrote Anon's attention to an ability to evoke explicit exponential beauty in scientific and natural form are simply stunning. I couldn't have said it better. Her poems have more recently appeared in The Rusty Tooth and The Walrus. She's recently become fascinated, she says, with her own attempts to write prose, even though her nine-year-old daughter insists that she's already a pro. Uh, let's take the, let's take the word of a nine-year-old for that. Um, our second speaker today will be Shailen Nielsen. Uh, Shailen was a little modest. He only talked about uh, the work that he's going to talk from today, so I did a little more digging. Uh, he's a poet, family physician, literary critic, and PhD candidate in the Department of English and Cultural Studies at McMaster University, uh, where he researches the representations of pain as a Vanier scholar. Congratulations on that. He's the author of a physician memoir, that's what I'm calling it, Call Me Doctor, in 2016, and several volumes of poetry, including Externally My Heart, 2008, Meniscus, 2009, and Complete Physical, 2010. His most recent book of poems is on shaving off his face for the Porcupine's Quill, 2015. Uh, he was shortlisted for the Trillium Poetry Prize in 2011. He won the Robin Blazer Award in 2015. Uh, he was recently shortlisted for the Shirk uh, Talent Award. Uh, congratulations to both of you on your accomplishments. When the other thing I thought when Josh said, you know, uh, could you do this? I said yes, and then I delved into the poetry and read it. Oh shit, they're really good. <laughs> um, so I'm humbled to be here today, and I'm simply going to turn things over to the two of you to do your readings in turn, please. Which I think you can do up there, or you're welcome to do them from here. What would you prefer? Podium's good. Good. Okay. Then I will take this out of your hand <laughs> and ask you to go to the podium. Thank you. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, even I can hear me. That's good. <laughs> All right, thanks, uh, thanks, Joel. I appreciate that introduction. Um, so I'm reading from On Shaving Off His Face. I'm glad you're all here. It's a beautiful festival. I want to uh, thank the Words Fest team and uh, Josh for having me. Um, you might wonder, you know, that's a revolting, disgusting, skin-crawling title, On Shaving Off His Face. But it's, it's intentionally so, because I want to be discomfited every time it's read in a room, you know? I don't want it to be, uh, I don't want it to be easy, not that other titles are easy, but for the thematic content of this book, I wanted something that was difficult, that would even make me um, uncomfortable, because the book itself is discomforting. Um, so I'm going to read the first poem from the first section. The first section of this book, On Shaving Off His Face, is about the iconography of the face and mental illness. So this is where I'm from. It's called General Preamble. <coughs> they looked and knew what was wrong. Your face designed to break and break again on illness. Blood and alcohol, the rural isolate you wear as helmet. But skin masks envelop grief masks. More blood, alcohol, and always need. Your face immerses except for wonder. Baptismal fonts troubled by your father with the face of icon, who presses his own face to an oil rag and transfers to you his terrible sainthood. The saint of fear, Nicholas of Myra. You learn a rictus grin for all good nights to chasten the tongues that chide teeth, a sound that mimics the closing of gates. Blame is the function of your face. You are here, wanderer, to be known by how you come. If we welcome you, it is because we take your face and emblazon our flags against your cause, a cause so plainly seen, to be free. But you cannot be. 
for your face is pain's currency. Others spend it for you. Not proud, nor revenant of the self, a woman taught you first and best that dreams of death are madly coming true, squandered is the dream. Look at yourself and know that the common went predictably wrong some beginning ago. A line to comprise a face, the fire was wont. But it's not true. Fire melts a face and makes it into what fire wants, the reformation of burn. You are free to yearn as your face coils, recoils, falls, and resurrects. Look one last time. Take the oil rag. Press it there. I'm going to jump to the third section of the book. It's about the illness of my son. And my son has a, <coughs> has a rare variant of epilepsy. Uh, it's not a nice kind. Sometimes one can have epilepsy and have a seizure every once in a while, or have a seizure or two and never have it again, or have many seizures and be placed on drugs and they're controlled. That's not exactly the story of my son. So I was talking to actually John Nyman at, at lunch. Sometimes poems require more of an apparatus. I don't know if this one does, but I just want to share it with you. Um, he was seizing so often that my wife and I would travel in the ambulance. We would take turns. This is in the city of Guelph when I used to live there. And uh, one time it was my turn um, to take the car uh, in behind the ambulance. Um, he'd been seizing, seizing for 20 minutes by the time the paramedics had been finished uh, doing their work with him. Um, and I didn't, that, that had been longer than it had ever gone before. So the ambulance took him to the hospital, and I followed him behind in the car. I parked at the bottom of Delhi Street, which I'm sure Matt Hearn knows. And, um, you know, I parked at the bottom of the hill, and the hospital's on the top. And I didn't know if he'd be alive. He was, but I didn't know. This one's called See the Marquee. And the epigraph is from William James. The most characteristic of all the elements of the conversion crisis is the ecstasy of happiness produced. I said, don't let him die. And I, I, I will. I will change and become like the sky, open, prismatic, where thunder and white border Incredible blue, I'll hold him and know that I owe you. Belief is to understand the recast plea. Me, me, old family trees, church keys, locks, fever, debris. You gave him reprieve. He stopped falling free. What ecstasy this, and live with I, a copy of me. I sit in the churches and see the marquee. A sick, bleeding son, the revenant trustee. I hold him now. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. I keep the bargain like faith keeps me. Angry, small, held inside fathomless walls. Supreme sky that widens past the human gift. Give away, take away what we want. This. And now the second section of the book, which is more intellectually ambitious than the other sections. <coughs> Brief, briefly, the second section of the book is a conference. It's the record of an imaginary conference. It's a conference held out of time. It's a psychiatric conference, an impossible one, in which various figures from the history of psychiatry, loved ones, doctors, patients, appear, and they all speak regarding a theory that is only quasi-imaginary by Charles Darwin, who is the original affect theorist who wrote uh, the emotion, On the Emotion of Man and Animals. Um, 
And so I use Darwin's ideas in a loose way throughout the section of the book, but it's an imaginary conference and I grab the people who have affected me in history and I have them testify. And here is one such testimony. It's Robin Pecknold, lead singer of the Fleet Foxes, still alive last I heard. And he is descending the steps of Pennsylvania Hospital in 1786. It's called Naval Physiologist Three, and here is the epigraph from Benjamin Rush. The only foundation for a useful education in republic is to be laid in religion. Without this, there can be no virtue. Without virtue, there can be no liberty. And liberty is the object and life of all republican governments. So Robin has been sprung. He is walking down the hospital steps, a free man. Always down. On the marbled steps, I refused to sing like the bird held in the cage it flew into or made. I looked back at the hospital. How long it was, a thousand years before, I came and beat my breast against bars erected to keep me safe. Bars that predicted my arrival based on oncoming song. The doctor here mentioned the moon, used leeches and cups, forbade me to sing. Was my difficulty a woman? Sexual inanition? I can't remember, though I feel the same. All I hoped would change within me stayed. The brakes occur along faults that crack, but no pressure is applied. I am not mad. It was a woman. She held me as a delusion does, seeking out weaknesses. In the morning, the sufferer wakes up enlightened and without distraction. I wandered the town for a week, afraid to think or see, and sung folk hymns to God. The doctor suggests impiety is my problem. I told him I never believed and never would. He asked me why I knew the words to the hymns. I said I wanted to believe that the Holy Spirit is a bird cloistered in church attics, refused flight, kept in the dark. We all hear the bird trying to escape. And so I know the words, melody, and beat to the praiseful songs. Still the doctor would not let me sing, allowed no visitors either. Too fragile a case, quiet and dark, my prescribed treatments. To stay alive, I dreamed of birds keeping a moonlit exile on Lake Erie. No man or God troubling these mute, unheard birds who exist in me. I turn now, the brittle steps enclosed in a canopy of green, the sun so rarely seen in my stay, beating down upon all it hits and flattens and makes better, all love turning towards the great light to disintegrate. A bird that sings or a bird that has no song, after all is said and after all is done, God only knows which of them I'll become. One more. <coughs> Does anyone know who Emil Kraepelin is? Don't need to shout it out. You can just raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody? Two. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So now I'm on the spot. I better get it right. <coughs> Kraepelin, in my opinion, is a much more influential figure uh, in contemporary psychiatry and medicine than Freud. Um, Kraepelin is a Russian psychiatrist who's been long dead. He was a contemporary, more, more or less, of Freud's. Um, and he was the fellow who categorized psychiatric illness according to symptom. So he's largely responsible for the diagnostic and statistics manual um, that doctors now use to identify people with various kinds of mental illness. It was him that thought somebody has this particular symptom, that particular symptom, it all groups according to this kind of um, name. He was the guy who grouped things together and kind of systematized psychiatry. At least he was the start of that. In this poem, Kraepelin is having marriage problems. Able Physiologist 4 
In the tongue of schizophysics, Emile Kraepelin argues nightly for sexual hygiene. My own dreams interpret the dreamer. No word is a strange dream. Too uncommon are my words to make sense of shouts, mutterings, and associations. Yes, once I dreamed I was in a room with Ina, my sleeping wife. I stood and said to the self-stunned dreamer, what interest dreams if dreams are biological? This question took me 50 dreamed years on a night when my wife classified our lives as unhappy, restricting me to never touch her again. We had four daughters together. That night, made the last, that night I made the last entry in a personal record of 300 dreams. Dream record 300. Love the undergird and purloined loin. Love absurd in a cordinal red breast and cardinal. Love the racked black brow and bow and bow. Love in Trieste blood flows and arrows. And never any shields love without women and men. And never any shields love condemned in buildings and undergirded in construction. Love of loins and love of listening in. The transcribed love of what is in me. In lava and category, and error, and Corian, and Amnion, and Sorrowward, and Rome. Love the mistake made when young, the substitute placeholder, and alternate song. The bell rung as men and women are hung, arm in arm in me, in front of me, and behind me, and in me, and love without love in me, and the meme of me, and do this in memory of me, and Luther reform the me in me, and the poor heart. Never any shield. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, WordsFest, uh, for this uh, opportunity uh, to share uh, what I love with you. And um, it's really a great honor to be in the company of um, such uh, uh, respected and esteemed writers, uh, many of who I've, I've, I've read uh, from. So uh, I am going to read to you uh, from poems throughout my first collection here. I'm going to start with a, a quote from another poet, though. Um, Synchronicity is a theme science can't explain. Mutual appreciation brought us no closer. More like we showed each other what we're made of. I'll say it again. Synchronicity is a theme science can't explain. Mutual appreciation brought us closer, no closer, um, more like we showed each other what we're made of. So that's a, a, the first few lines from a poem, from a poem entitled Pigeon by Karen Solly. And um, uh, synchronicity is, is a theme that, well, if you, there are a few synchronous things in nature that science actually can explain, um, but most, most of the time um, there are things we can't explain and they still fascinate me. And so um, there, I do use a lot of that in my work um, and I'm, I'm fascinated by the things that we can't explain. Um, at the same time, I am a scientist. I actually only started writing poetry uh, after having been fully trained as a scientist um, and, and practicing science, uh, doing science, making discoveries, uh, and knowing many things that you can't then unknow. Uh, so to put everything together was a great uh, challenge for me. Um, but that's, that's what I tried to do. Um, and the synchronicity is also uh, going to shape the selection of poems that I've chosen to read to you today. It happens to be, because it's always a difficult choice, especially in a book like mine where there is a great diversity of form and subject. Um, so it's hard to give you a, a feel for what the whole thing is in just 10 minutes. Uh, so today is the 11th anniversary of my marriage, um, and so I thought I would look to see just how much 
of my poetry involves my marriage. In fact, there are actually more poems in here that I'll have time to read, which surprises me because it's not a, a, a theme that I, I set out to do. Um, uh, on the other thing that it kind of reflects, though, is the fact that this book really does uh, represent a very long period of time, um, being my first book. So it, you know, I started writing poetry long before my marriage, and so on, and so that you'll see that here and there in the in the poem. So, but we're going to start with a proposal on Cedar Street. A single maple tree arrives on the sill. That's chance crossing the threshold with relief. First frost insists no way back out. And then the next night, in dreams, a silent helicopter lands where it was never meant to go. The mind, dappled, gray, some leftover light, a safer address for wind to whisper scripted fates, samsara. The little and beautiful proofs of trait convergence. This Samara, fruit wrapped in brown paper entering the file drawers of winter. An unforeseeable thinness, rented time, whirling, sealed with hypotheses. Now you're going to have a snapshot of my wedding night. <laughs> Held in a fist. Mother knows silk and rice, grabs fist fills, fistfuls at fabric land and bulk barn. Shouts out a name, gives a grade. Quality is a gold wedding set. Fine filigree that speaks for a wrinkled neck. The clink of everyday bangles, hint of saffron in slow-cooked basmati rice pudding. There are things we remember forever because they existed. That orange-red, my henna palms, never seen elsewhere. Not incarnation, sunset, vein of rock. See how pigmented roots and shoots entwine with lifelines. Decorated stems, leaves, petals that evolve into peacocks, polka-dotted paisley, checkerboards, crescent moons, inward spirals, just plainly left unsaid. Um, so one of the things that happens to me a lot is that the um, language I encounter in my daily life is so different from the language that I, <laughs> that we speak to each other. Um, it comes through emails or scientific papers or anything, and um, you know, often you know the um, there's there's dual meanings, right? There's there's metaphorical possibilities, and then there's simply just dual meanings of words as they're used in in science and how we use them. Um, sometimes the relationship is trivial, sometimes it's quite profound. Um, and um, the other thing, so this poem is entitled um, Soul and Place, but it's referring to fish because uh, we were working on a mod doing a mathematical model of flatfish. And uh, I was, it involves my husband, you'll see various ways, but Specifically, we, we've ended up starting to collaborate on research projects as well. So that shows up now in this period of our life. <laughs> the title is Soul and Place on the Mathematics of Flatfish. S's and P's, graphic displays of dashed curves. Effort versus catch. Fewer exponents when I cancel out the redundant variables. The new addition to the house dinner reservations in Toronto. I've been trying to have it all, to make a good model. In Paris, the Tour Eiffel traded off for a pond, toy boats, an attraction of water and gravity, yellow line one, direction la défense, the leading end. 
with no one driving, excited to be the first to detect approaching light. Some graphs are so complex, they lie in between dimensions. The divine bistro beside the cemetery that served sole marinière, dredged in flour, then fried in butter, clarified by heat and je ne sais quoi. It's everything I wanted. And I said there must be a way to remove the bones all in one go. Every spine, rib, and pin pulled like this. The next poem uh, is a found poem. There are 13 poems in the book that are extracted um, solely from the language of one of my own scientific articles. I scanned the article, I chose words, and um, that was my constraint that I would only use words in the scientific article. Um, and so that's what it is. Um, and it was quite surprising to find certain words in there that I hadn't realized I had used. Um, and all the poems are very different. So this one happens to come from a scientific article that is co-authored with uh, two other people, uh, one of which is my husband. And this inc the words are, the title is also extracted from the text in the um, articles. Various authors have described. It's a list. Architectural novelty, taxa, including plants, insects, fishes, and birds, parental behavior, an analog for fitness, pots put outside into containers, exposed temporary and irregular offspring, seasonally and permanently difficult to determine habitats, southern France in autumn, Longevity of the individual, a marsh. Depth to be an absolute constraint. A constant probability of death. A string of arbitrarily bad years. A genetic component. The adaptive value of spring. Potential nonlinearities. Geese. A relationship broad enough to be meaningfully different. Uh, two more poems. Uh, the next one is also a found poem and uh, also from an article that is co-authored with uh, two students and my husband, who we co-supervised co the students. Oh, and I should say, I like to do this as well. That, that found poem I just told you was from an article entitled <clears throat> Variable offspring size as an adaptive, um, as an adaptation to environmental heterogeneity in a clonal plant species, integrating experimental and mod modeling approaches, published in the Journal of Ecology. Okay, so this one is called The Strategy of the Majority. Is falling back, pre existing tendencies, cooperation from the public a vector for the spread of catastrophic programs. Purchasing strength, payoff or penalty, the rich are unfinished. Do not bring education campaigns, economic incentives, or ordinary differential equations with fixed carrying capacity to the final destination. The strategy of the majority is falling. Adher reducing adherence to control measures. The price of finding equilibria is increasing. That is from an article entitled Modeling Interactions Between Forest Pest Invasions and Human Decisions Regarding Firewood Transport Restriction, published in the journal uh, PLOS One. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm going to end with, um, with this poem here, which um, is, uh, let's see here, it's, it's entitled, this is not a found poem. <laughs> it's kind of found, but not from a scientific article. Um, in fact, it's found, I wrote this sort of at the, towards the end of, of the book, and it's, it is, it's entitled, this is the ring of six. 
Um, and so I, it's a list of things that involve the number six. I was a, I'm a little bit obsessed with numbers, being an ecological modeler, um, and as a poet, actually, um, counting syllables and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, and it also, the list here refers partly to just things uh, that I know or found that involve the number six, but they also refer to uh, the, some poems in the, book it's, in the book itself, where it turned out that there was the number six involved with those things. This is the Ring of Six. Wedded years, gifts of sugar or iron, children around the rosy, number six Cylons, species of the genus Quiscalis, degrees of separation, ounces of sugar in the easy chocolate cake recipe, months we spent trying to conceive, irises connected by rhizomes, legs of insects breaking down macromolecules into simple sugars, hair trends to try in 2013, planets orbited by one or more satellites, nations of the Grand River First Nation, kingdoms of life. Poppy heads we planted three years ago, finally emerging. Plastic pop yolks that have become marine litter. Carbons, cyclohexane. Carbons, benzene, a resonance structure. Thank you. use it in a way that is poetry that is not 
um, does not science first or that discourse first, but to use it as poetry. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a little trick, uh, an advantage. Uh, at least I like to think of it as such. Um, so I, 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 we had the reverse experience in a sense because I came to poetry uh, later, after being immersed in science for many years. Um, and so, the, but you know, once I started to, um, you know, I needed to figure out what I was doing, and I, I, I read a lot of poetry. And I mean, you know, there's, I don't know, chicken and egg, egg type of thing, but I, uh, the poets. And poetry I admired had no, didn't have any science in it. I, it was, it's not that I was attracted to scientific poetry, um, quite the opposite. And in fact, my first uh, you know, poems that I wrote, I deliberately avoided using any of my scientific knowledge or language. Um, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, because I, I don't know. <laughs> I just I wanted to write beautiful poetry, and I didn't. Um, I guess maybe I just didn't know how to do it, or I felt that it would be a crutch, or it would be too much of a trick, or something. You know. Um, so uh, so there are you know, several <coughs> poems. In fact, there's a, a love poem in here, strict, like straight up love poem to my husband, which I didn't read to you. Um, that uh, you know, and so. Uh, but then, you know, over time and like over maturity, I think, uh, of, of becoming a, a, a poet, I realized that to communicate everything that I wanted to, my full experience, I, I had to use it. And that's when it, when it came in. And, and the realization was slow and it was difficult and uh, uh, because it's, 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 yeah. And, and I fought it for quite a long time. And the, idea to do those found poems from my own scientific articles was the was actually a suggestion um, that came out of a discussion with my editor um, because I'd never considered to to do that I'd mm -hmm. never even considered sort of what was right under my nose mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and you you published you included some of your own poetry in your PhD dissertation oh yeah well I there love you don't if you want to see how far I've come, <laughs> you, on the shelves of the, you know, the, go to the library, there's an electronic version of my thesis there, you can see, because um, that's when I first started writing poetry, was in the final year of writing up my, my PhD thesis here, just down the road, and uh, uh, non-scientific, I, I don't know, sometimes these categories I find a little hard to... I don't like to divide things up into different worlds, but um, uh, no, not obviously scientific poems. Um, and anyway, my PhD supervisor, um, I kind of told him what I was doing at the time. And he said, oh, well, you should publish them in your thesis. And so I did. I put one poem to preface each of my uh, thesis chapters. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> well, both of your your work, I'm mean, going to think of the, the emergence of psychiatry. I mean, it all happens in the 18th, later 18th, early 19th centuries. And, you know, we're so disciplined bound now, which I really hate. So we talk about interdisciplinarity, but we don't often practice it. But at that time, you know, poets were physicians, and physicians were poets. And they were polymathic thinkers and writers. And there was a moment when everything was up for grabs, intellectually, but also aesthetically and poetically, so forth and so on. So, I mean, I have to ask if somebody who's in the profession or in the academy as well. This is sort of a follow-up to the question I just asked. What kind of resistance did you meet with? Uh, because our disciplines are very boundaried, <laughs> as it were, and limited. What kind of resistance or did you when you first said, I'm a poet, and but I'm also a doctor, or I'm, I'm a professor of ecology, and I'm also publishing poetry? Or did you meet any resistance? I have to say, I've had, I, I both had it easy and difficult. Two minds collaborating. It's kind of annoying. <laughs> Professorial and the answer. Um, so I had it hard on myself, and I, had, I made it hard on myself when I was going through medical school, as you as you saw in Calm Doctor, which is the, the memoir of my uh, my life, uh, my training life as a as a physician, as a medical student. I when I remember waiting to make it hard on myself, uh, 
for reasons that are mysterious to me now, the men you know also do well and um, dysphoric. Um, and paradoxically, unwell in the institution that's supposed to make people well. So I was at odds with myself, but I was also crucially at odds with the institution. Um, and then you add the being a poet into the mix, and uh, I don't know, it's kind of like a uh, uh, perfect storm. Anyway, that, that being said, I made it hard for myself, which is the biographical answer, um, and I continue to do the task. <laughs> but the institution out east at Dahazi wasn't, uh, wasn't it, it was strangely accommodating. And I have an experience, I think, that uh, cannot be, uh, could not be said to be duplicated at least by students going through the institution, um, going through the medical institution at the time that I went through in 96 to 2000. So that's not, that's not an age ago, but medical education, you know, there's been a few turns around the sun. And at that time, it was actually a department of medical humanities. It was the first department of medical humanities in Canada. It was headed up by a former two-time dean of medical school, uh, Dr. T.J. Murray, who's a prominent figure in the history of medicine and still going. Um, so there was institutional power behind uh, provision of medical education from a humanities perspective. So in a weird way, uh, Dalhousie also was the most suited to somebody who wanted to be a poet. And indeed, as an institution in Canada, it was the first of not first in North America because that distinction goes to the US um, somewhere. I can't remember where. But Dal had the first um, uh, poet residence at the medical school whose name is uh, Glenn Downey. Um, there's really not a few books that are better medically themed. So I, at Dal, it was, it was, it was, it was great. Um, I met Dr. Murray, who was kind to me even though I was unwell. Um, and I ended up getting married with Dr. John Budd, who was the chief forensic pathologist of the province, uh, who also was responsible for the Swiss air crash. And so he was uh, examining the bodies. And I went out with him to the Sherwater hangar, uh, we went through bones that have been dredged up from the bottom of the ocean and I wrote a bad but uh, important to my kind of history and development and feeling through medicine and death and uh, poetry. I wrote a book about, uh, about that crash, about the, about the bodies at the bottom. Um, so I, I, looked out, I, I like to think that anybody, uh, even when they're not well, can strangely benefit from circumstances. You know, you just gotta keep, just gotta keep your mind open. And uh, it takes care of you, you know. Thank you. Um, I think I want to maybe suggest that um, I don't think any poets ever have it easy. <laughs> um, it's just not an easy thing to do. Uh, so, um, but your question is specifically about mixing the disciplines and um, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know what to say about that because I just do it. I've just been, I haven't been trying to put them together in the sense of my professional life per se. I mean, um, so nobody cares what you do. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the nice things about being a professor is that <coughs> there's nobody looking over your shoulder. So during the day, I'm in my office and the muse, you know, is coming. Um, you know, as it often does, I feel like I'll just start drafting a poem, you know. So, I mean, um, but, um, but, you know, the, and, and so you just find time to do it, and, and I think that's a challenge that all writers have. But, um, but in terms of the, you know, the work and when the book came out, it's been positive. Uh, it, you know, working in a university, it, it was really wonderful to see that there is um, uh, that it, that the university is kind of functioning as 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 it should, and that um, all all discoveries are vetted and <laughs> and celebrated. And so, you know, um, I, um, I I found that to be the case. Um, you know. One thing that uh, you know, one, I'm very aware of is the is the, you know the, the divide between the arts and the sciences. I mean, it's it's very unfortunate, um, but it's very real. It's very concrete. It's not just people uh, not appreciating what each other does. People appreciate it very much, I, I think. Um, but 
you know, the sciences are way more funded than the arts, and so on. And so there's, you know, there's all kinds of real uh, difficulties there. So I, I, I would love to see more integration, more. Um, so if there's challenges, it's ways of finding, you know, you know, finding uh, spaces, funding, you know, support to to bring the disciplines more together in universities. So if anybody here has the uh, capacity to do that, um, you know, I, I think we actually, you know, we do the poets coming in and writers in residence is is a wonderful thing, but I think we need some even more. We need more arts and science uh, collaboration. We have a start. Uh, uh, a couple of things about that after you after I start. Well, one is, um, you know, the discipline of medicine, the only, the best thing I can think of uh, for it being conducive to writing poetry, I think of the famous, I'm sure many of you know this, um, how William Carlos Williams used to write uh, job and notes between patients in his office. That's a, that's a old chestnut for sure. But I, I, I felt a little bit discomforted finishing on the note that I did where you know everything seemed to turn out all right because I'm talking about a specific place and a specific time and when I look at things now uh, there is a resistance towards the incorporation of the arts and science at least I speak for the discipline of medicine and the way it's complex uh, as things usually progress things get more and more complicated but they also generally stay the same the resistance stays the same so now there's the ostensible incorporation of uh, of the arts and medicine, particularly the rubric of narrative medicine. Um, yet, uh, it's a ghetto. Yet it's a particular place in which one can say uh, it's been incorporated, but really at the level of medical education, it's, um, it's the lowest in the hierarchy and first thing to get cut um, and not taught by experts. So when I look at uh, the arts as deployed in medicine, I do see things improving slowly over time, but I also see tokenism and uh, I also see a, um, a non-expert uh, non approach to, to teaching. So I personally feel, and that's why I'm doing a PhD um, in English and Cultural Studies, I personally feel that um, this kind of teaching, bringing together, or bringing humanities concepts into the medical faculty, uh, into medicine, uh, should be done by people who actually embrace and teach the humanities. Um, and I, I think that would be the the ideal outcome. Ultimately, my, my dream would be to have uh, an equal playing field and to have undergraduate humanities students and undergraduate medical students learning collaboratively together. And I think that that would be the real evidence that there's uh, that there's a that there's uh, an equality or at least uh, a sharing happening. Do I answer your question about that on the poster? That would really help my thoughts a lot. Sure. Thank you. We have. I mean, one of the things I'm finding is that. Where the groundswell of, of 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 urgency about this is coming from the students, you know, how come we're not having discussions about poetry and medicine together? How come we're not having discussions about poetry and science? That's a really good thing that's happening. It's happening at Western in undergrad and in graduate education as well. And I'm glad to see it happening. I teach a course on leadership, which is primarily students not. It's an English course, but it's primarily not students in English. A lot of them for medical science, health science, life sciences. And I remember saying one day, this is where my own bias came in. I'm going, you know, this is a huge division between arts and science, and I don't understand why it's there. And I was on my soapbox about the importance of arts and humanities because I passionately believe in that. But a science student put his hand up and said, well, we experiment. <laughs> oh, okay, touche. That is to say, he saw a sort of creative vitality in the work that he was doing. I saw the blindness of what it was that I was doing. That was a nice, that was a nice uh, moment. I have, it's interesting that you say you want to work towards writing prose, and you have this, especially in the section on the conference, oh, that's, that blew me away, um, writing about the imaginary conference, and I sense that you're not a big fan of conferences, unnecessarily, I won't ask you to comment on it. Depends on the conference. Depends on the conference, yeah. Um, so, but they're, they're very prose-oriented work, that is to say, between poetry and prose, um, completely disappears. What do you what do you think of the difference between those two things? Why do you have this urgency to write in prose and do you see them as different or simply extensions of one another? I'll start with you. I, I, I don't know. I, I think that maybe what happened was that when I when my book came out, um, I, I you know I had basically been exclusively been reading poetry for the 
10 years <laughs> prior to that. Um, and, uh, and then I stopped completely. I couldn't read any, any new poetry. I haven't quite, I read a, a bit of Shaving with this. I, I, I just couldn't for, you know, don't know. So I turned my attention to prose um, and was reading some short fiction and so on. And so that is partly that, but it, I think also, I don't know, I've been trying to write some poems actually since uh, it's been almost two years now since the, this would have been finished and um, finding it very hard <laughs> to do. Uh, and one of the poems actually are, feel like they're, they're stories. And so it's just a, it's a very natural thing. But, and yet I, I don't know how to write, you know, I haven't, I don't, haven't done much of it. So it's, it is I experimenting and learning and kind of doing the same thing that I did with, with poetry, reading, learning from what I'm reading, aspiring to, uh, you know, write to a certain level because I, I know what I find good. Um, and I know, you know, that it's better than what I'm doing. So I, I it's sort of this just this feedback. But in terms of the differences, um, I like what uh, Andre Alexis said in the um, reception about the relationship. Uh, in that um, they're just they're two very you know prose. This is what he said, and I, I think I tend to agree that you know prose can't do what poetry does, but it, it can um, it can can use the the techniques of poetry and. Um, I imagine that's going to happen to me when I, as I, well, I think it is already happening. Your verse actually reads like beautiful prose, very long. It's an interesting collapse. It's verse. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there are some prose yeah. things in there, yeah. I'm going to try my crazy idea on you all. It's like something I get into arguments with uh, the people. It doesn't make sense. That's the great part about poetry. Sound is more important than sense, and let sound and sense together. Anyway, give it a shot. So, um, poetry is well known as the base, uh, the, the, the ground floor of our literature. So, Western literature is founded upon poetry. I think we can agree on that premise. And so, therefore, you know, we got there first. You know, uh, <laughs> we as poets. So, poetry will never die. I agree with George Eliot Clark last night about that. I also think that it is the most efficient expression of emotion, although there are short hands. I mean, it's the most efficient expression of emotion in, in, uh, in words, but um, visual representations of music will always have a straight shot to our souls, correct? So, um, sometimes I just think hierarchically, but here's my idea. Um, my idea is that Prose is comprised of poetry. That's my idea. Uh, it's not a new idea. The, there's a distinction to be made. But I think, and this is where the weird part comes in, I think of the world, I, it's, it's odd, but I think of the world as basically comprised of poetic atoms. I think of material as having affect, and I think that ultimately affect comes down to poetry. This doesn't have to make a lot of sense. But it makes sense, I guess, enough when I'm sitting in front of the page or the screen. I think of, uh, so for example, this may be a total cliche, but it's just want to pop out. Um, you see sports announcers using this one, poetry, you know, poetry in motion. I see, I see phrases like that used in the culture. This is poetic. You know, people will reach for, they reach for and they're trying to say beautiful, perhaps, to say it's poetic. Um, I think that, I think that we're comprised of this force. I think of it as a force in the universe. Um, but if I had to come up with an equation, uh, it would be sound and sense. Sound plus sense equals. And um, in poetry, the relative uh, values of those terms, it would be much more on the sound end. I think more, much more, it would be more on the sound end. And in prose, it would be more on the sense end. It must be intelligible, but then we get into a lot of arguments about what kind of prose we're talking about, what kind of poetry we're talking about. But for me, um, I'm with Poe, and I think that, uh, I think that uh, Sound matters uh, quite a lot, and inherent in sound is sense um, yeah. quite a lot. So I think that the weight the weight goes to the the sound side in poetry, and uh, the intelligibility, the sense side goes in prose. Um, Very cool. Thank you. I've talked up too much time asking the questions. Or, um, just
just at uh, the finish time, but we do have some time for questions. Anyone from the audience? Yes. section of the book moves on 
and considers what it was like to be sick in Dr. Benjamin Rush. Uh, so there's a whole section that has Dr. Benjamin Rush unwell. Um, and then the third section is returning to family poems, poems of love and loss, but inflected by that same energy. Uh, so I, uh, I continue to write about it, but I think that that will be the final, the final book uh, that takes on, takes on that kind of energy in a uh, sustained way. It, it'll be the, it'll be the third in what I, what I call myself in my own head, the, the affect trilogy that I have. <laughs> and um, I'm going to move on and uh, talk about my own province, New Brunswick, after that. But uh, Mender, do you, do you feel changed when you're done at all? Um, did you want to say something? <laughs> I feel a change when I, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I feels good, feels good when I write. <laughs> Um, I feel, um, yeah, you know, there's this very uncomfortable feeling sometimes, and yeah, I, I, I think that's my simple answer too, is that it does feel good to write. I mean, it's, it's difficult, and it also feels bad, but the, the you know, the process, there is a, a force, and that, that movement feels good. Um, and uh, um, yeah, about <coughs> transformation, I, you know, um, my poems uh, deal with all kinds of losses, but including losses of um, non human things, uh, species, and so forth, ecosystems. And, and my scientific work deals with those things as well. Um, and so I, I find uh, poetry. Uh, kind of more, um, if, we're, if we're trying to think of uses or transformations, um, it, it, it's a way of thinking through some of those kinds of losses and expressing them in ways that we perhaps um, haven't done so. And that, you know, maybe it's that lack of expression that um, um, is, is missing and could lead to, I don't know, don't want to make too many promises about for poetry, but um, but there is also a whole other field of, you know, eco-poetics, for example, and there's quite a lot of um, politically driven poetry, right, eco-politically and, and various types of political poetry. So there's, uh, there is this idea of poetry as activism as well, um, and um, uh, what I found, actually, one surprising thing that I uh, found, and it does, in the end, come down to just uh, discovery, which is a very, very pleasurable, ple pleasurable feeling, whether it's in whatever discipline, whatever aspect of your life it is. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's, it, uh, well, I was inviting those found poems and discovering that um, there could be a whole other narrative or there could be a, a whole other beautiful thing coming out of um, fairly dry and um, <laughs> um, formulaic text that is addressing a very serious environmental problem um, and uh, that it can comes from within the same place uh, to me it, uh, it makes sense somehow it, it, it's a sense it, it, it makes sense that it comes from there. In the end, all we really do have is language. And, um, uh, yeah. It's like embedding a species, what you do with the poetry. Yeah. Almost. We have time to squeeze in until they kick us out, I guess. Time to squeeze in one more question. No? Thank you.